Arun has joined. I can see like. Yes. <clears throat> Okay, so here's what I'm thinking. Um, <clears throat> um, the specific question on by Ethereum, I think Ethereum is Judah. I don't know if I'm revealing their entity, but uh, that is something only um, they can answer, like what is actually meaningful and what is progress in human affairs is a complex question. So uh, what what I was thinking was uh, <clears throat> maybe we can look at this uh, specific thing uh, wire meta issue from the very uh, basics of uh, uh, social media content moderation uh, communication uh, and how computers or computer technology can play a role or not can play a role he is playing the big role in all of these and uh, uh, what uh, some of the technical issues there are and uh, though the, the, the technical issues are actually really closely linked with the human uh, issues uh, or things like identity trust um, uh, control authority and stuff like that. So <laughs> it will it will connect together uh, towards the end. I am assuming, and uh, uh, it will kind of make sense uh, that it becomes an answer to the question on what is progress. Also, so um, how do we start this? Uh, Vaishnavi, why don't you go ahead and uh, kind of talk about what you uh, kind of uh, you know have read about the specific issue already so that that becomes the context and then we can uh, start from that okay so what i know is i know the i read the very first thing which they put out that uh, uh, this guy this bjp guy has direct direct access to facebook uh, to meta uh, officials and whatever post he reports on Instagram gets taken down directly. Uh, and that was what Wire initially put out, and which seems very plausible. And they also gave explanation, they gave like uh, screenshots of like, the, see, this, this, this has happened. And uh, they I mentioned that the whistleblower inside Meta has told them this. So this is what I understood from like the very first investigation they put out. And then the second thing happened in which Wire uh, so Meta official is saying that how the hell this thing leaked, this thing being that uh, the whole thing of BJP officials reporting uh, the post and it got taken down. So that that person is asking and Wire put out those screenshots which many people said that these emails, these email domain doesn't exist. These screenshots are, um, what do you say, fabricated and all. Then Wire said that these screenshots are not fabricated. The email domain does exist. And then today, and then what is happening today, DKIM and everything, I don't understand. So this has been my whole understanding in which, yeah, so... Yes, so basically how big corporates will just like big corporates have uh, the big corporates who have like such big, huge uh, power to, you know, shape or fabricate public opinion are just hand in hand with the government. And there is no ethics or like ethics or privacy policy or any, you know, objectivity there. So, yeah, so that has been my understanding. If everything which is happening is true hmm, 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 hmm. I, I i think that's a very uh, objective uh, uh, 
description of what we know as in what people who are neither working inside meta nor working inside wire know as of now uh, the 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 issue kind of uh, has many many facets to it so uh, i'm i'm just going to take a deviation here uh, it's uh, of course the context has been set the foundational questions that we need to ask is what i will go through one by one so the first question uh, we have to kind of uh, ask ourselves is um, is that of uh, identity <clears throat> so let's say i am speaking um, to you in 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 real life uh, physical life how, how do we know that it is uh, the person who we think they are that that they are speaking to you so for example there is a story by i mean i don't know it's an urban myth or what but uh, Einstein, after uh, getting uh, becoming very famous, uh, was uh, going on giving many lectures in many places, and uh, once he became uh, kind of tired and, or the driver kind of uh, was listening multiple times and proposed to Einstein, "You're telling the same thing everywhere, so I can uh, give the lecture, same lecture, uh, because I've kind of uh, remembered all of it." So uh, then, apparently, the driver gives a lecture, and uh, uh, <laughs> someone asks a question at the end. And uh, this driver says, uh, um, "It's a such a simple question; even my driver can uh, answer it." Uh, and I mean, Einstein had uh, come as the driver; uh, they had switched roles, so something like that. So basically, the question there uh, is: How do people know who is Einstein? Who is the Einstein they think? And who who is the Einstein uh, that is real life? Uh, so uh, that's a vague question. I know I've uh, termed it very vaguely. But uh, any thoughts on that? How do we establish identity in in real life, and then uh, also of course online? Uh, how do we know that the person whom we are speaking to is the person whom we think they are? Um, I'm hoping Arun is able to hear us now. Darren also seemed like disconnecting and reconnecting. Can you all type in the chat if you're hearing? Yeah, I can hear you actually. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Dad. Um, I guess Arun and uh, Ravi can't hear us. Arun, Ravi. No, I can hear too. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Ravi, I see you unmuted yourself, but uh, I can't hear you. Anyhow, uh, so uh, thoughts on that? How do we establish identity? Is this an open question, actually? Yeah, yeah, open. I mean, so I think like, um, I mean. I feel like I would probably look at it. I, I can't really recall this thing that I read about. Uh, I'm not sure if it's like, it, it's basically a square which you draw and uh, you describe that a person's identity has two versions to it. The one that you think you know about yourself and the one that others know about you. And I think when you collectively put both of those together, then that sort of at least points out to some form of what your identity looks like. But at any given point in time, I don't think like, that identity exists as a solid uh, shape that does not change over time. So I'm assuming, and I don't know if like how it gets shaped, but I'm assuming it's shaped through different influences, both internally and externally. Hmm. I feel like you're talking about uh, the formation of uh, self identity or like a uh, one's own identity. I'm I'm talking more uh, superficially. I'm talking about uh, how do you know the person you're talking to is uh, Einstein or uh, or is uh, uh, Narendra Modi or uh, you get a phone call and it's Amitabh Bachchan's voice? 
How do you know it's Amitabh Bachchan? So th that's the kind of identity I'm talking about. Got it. Got it. Not something metaphysical and uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so maybe uh, so you're talking about establishing identity within the digital world. In in real world as well. Uh, that's why I start with the story of Einstein and the driver. Uh, Am I audible now? Yeah. Yes, Ravi. Okay. So the question is about how you uh, how you maybe verify or uh, think like so for example in this case i can take an example of akshay so uh, let's say if i meet tomorrow how will i ensure that it's the same akshay right correct good question i mean good framing yeah yeah so i think yeah in your case maybe i have seen your photo as well but if uh, like that might be a <laughs> big clue but i think there, there is an overall overall data I, about you in my brain and it is like uh, I know uh, that this person knows this much at least maybe they know more more than that but like the way of talking and um, everything how they talk and what they know all of this this comes into picture and I think we can also uh, detect the discrepancies if we if, if that is some other person that does not match okay what they know <laughs> so for example no, i'm just <laughs> taking note for uh, uh, for a specific reason uh, please continue yeah yeah so uh, i encounter this so called problem in some sense in some way for example i have switched xmpp ids or something like that many times for uh, for for people who don't know what is XMPP ID, think of it like you know I change maybe phone numbers, and when I call from a new number, how will a person uh, how will a person th uh, understand that it is indeed Ravi, right? And I have thought about it many times. So what I have done many times is <laughs> even s send people a GPG signed uh, like a, a GPG signed message. To someone just to from from my keys which they sign but this usually does not happen i mean people probably trust from my voice and from what i talk and all that so i think this all comes into picture and brain probably quote unquote intuitively knows uh, from all this information that <laughs> it is it is this person right so it, it may not be accurate but then you, if you want to have a more uh, accurate level of verification, maybe you will you will have more steps. For example, there is some top secret in your hands or something like that, and then I want to ver verify that it is a share, you know, something like country's nuclear de nuclear deal secrets or something like that. So I will probably have more steps in my verification, right? Just not about your knowledge or something hmm, hmm, hmm. Uh, uh, let me uh, I, I took some uh, points there uh, from what you said uh, the reason uh, I took that down is uh, th these are very common uh, commonly used uh, everywhere uh, uh, say like bank checks for example use signature to match uh, uh, whether this is the actual person I don't know if they do it now, but uh, at least in the past they used to match signature and if the signature didn't match, they would reject the check, right? And uh, uh, this uh, whole idea of, of face and voice matching, that's the that's the way human beings but kind of... My, yeah? I was saying banks still do it. My check got rejected last week only because signature <laughs> didn't match. <laughs> it got bounced. Correct. True, true. So uh, even today, therefore, we are using, yeah. Darren? Yeah, sorry, sorry. I was just trying to comment on the check thing. Maybe that was a human issue. Maybe if they had an automated system for verification, that would have been better. Who knows? What if uh, human beings uh, wouldn't, I mean, would be lousy and automated systems would 
consider all I, things that don't match i think it yeah, was right. automated because there was something like when i sign my check i in my usual signature i don't add my surname but in that check i added like my surname too and then bank told me that your registered surname doesn't your yeah, registered signature doesn't have surname so the system didn't recognize your signature so let me actually Hello? note that down as well the 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 uh, thanks darren for bringing that point up because uh, that's also relevant to the conversation on meta um so uh, basically um we uh, have certain heuristics or certain parameters that we take into account to verify someone's identity and it's it gets even more complicated when we want to be completely sure like what if someone has done i mean there are so many movies from the past where people have done plastic surgery and look like someone else um, i don't know how they can do voice match but uh, some kind of uh, voice <laughs> distortion um and then signature you can fake um uh you can impersonate someone uh, rather easily uh, is what uh, um at least some movies make us believe uh, and it, there are exam exam uh, stories where people are impersonating someone else and uh, writing the exam for them so even uh, things like identity cards uh, are kind of uh, uh forgeable uh, something like that so uh, this becomes uh, important in the question of uh, two factor authentication or multi factor authentication like uh, any any uh, thoughts on what this multi factor authentication is uh, do, do, do you use two factor authentication uh, what is it yeah again it's an open question So I think I've seen this uh, two-factor authentication in TED exam, where mm -hmm. you have to uh, where you have to both provide your phone number and then also a login credential, and they say that that is more safer in case if one. Uh, I mean, I'm assuming probably if one login system is compromised, the other one acts as a safeguard. Hmm. Hmm. Correct. Correct. So uh, in the case of um, Uh, uh, password uh, it's uh, like ravi was saying something that only i know right uh, if if i'm entering password that means uh, uh, if i created that password only i would know that password unless i share it with someone else so it's something i know now uh, uh, the the in two factor authentication you need uh, something that you know and then something that is different like something like that you have so for example uh, in the case of telegram like dad was saying you have your phone sim so your phone sim is only with you and you can receive an sms on that sim and therefore you are proving that you know your password and you have your phone's sim card so that's two kinds of authentication so if it was two passwords for example does it make sense uh, to call it two factor authentication you have two passwords no i don't think so i feel like that's the same thing because it's not two different systems or techniques to uh, you know get into something or authorize something mm -hmm. true but but why do we need two systems uh, you have two locks two locks on your door isn't it more secure than one lock on your door uh not necessarily because it's the same door so it's very easy for a person to break in they just need to put more force rather than the normal amount of force required to break in or maybe more time breaking those two locks but otherwise they can still but it's the same problem it's not a different it's the same problem with one solution smart smart so basically uh, it's the same kind of problem with the same kind of solution is what you're saying so if i am keeping keys in a bunch uh, uh, in around my neck say then someone steals that bunch they'll get access to both the keys and they would unlock 
both the locks and uh, but if uh, one of it was a physical key and the other was a password then even if they stole the key uh, the password would be uh, something only i remember they can't steal it from my uh, mind so what i know is different from what i have and then um, people also say th there's this third factor or called what you are so that's where this uh, biometrics uh, face match and uh, voice match and those kinds of things come in wherein you could steal my uh, phone you could steal my uh, i mean you could uh, uh, ask me my password but if i am not there uh, and my voice doesn't match or my face doesn't match or my fingerprint doesn't match then the system says that you are not that person so that's the third factor um, that uh, usually people consider in uh, three factor or multi factor authentication now uh, the point here let's let's uh, take another deviation now how how what is this difference between automated uh, systems and human uh, systems um, doing these kinds of matching i mean any of these matching identity uh, how would you describe uh, how an automated system works what 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 kind of advantages and disadvantages do they have I think the advantage of an automated system is that uh, the it can manage a high volume of like a, a high load basically. But the problem, but the disadvantage is that maybe it comes at a cost of uh, you know maybe uh, some not everything that it tries to solve gets solved. So there might be some errors that pop up. And but I I can't really think of a disadvantage. Let's say one advantage that I could think of. <laughs> so, uh, why do errors come up? D don't you think computers are like perfect? Probably it depends on the uh, the level of, I mean, the the accuracy of the program. So maybe the programming has has not uh, realized that there was some issue that it needed to see, but that was a very critical. But it was an issue that probably the programmers didn't envision when they designed the program. So then finally they realize that that's a problem. So, I mean, maybe they're assuming that they are still haven't found the problem. Hmm. Hmm. Makes sense. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, masks, masks are kind of making it uh, impossible for the facial recognition algorithms that were earlier there to kind of detect faces the same way. So you would now have only half the face to run your uh, uh, parameters and it's like i mean you you would have met new people uh, who are wearing masks and you had a mental image in your mind and then they remove it and then suddenly it's a totally different image right like the face uh, with mask on is totally different from uh, face without the mask so the those kinds of unanticipated issues where uh, uh, what the programmer who made the system thought would always be true if they change uh, of course the systems can fail and also sometimes uh, some of these systems are not deterministic so deterministic is when so let's say um, you are entering a password so how, how does a password work i have uh, created an account on some service i would have told okay my password is um, 9999 which is a very unsafe password but um, uh, let's say it's my ATM pin now the the computer the next time I want to claim that I am me uh, I insert the ATM card into the slot and then I enter the password 9999 uh, the computer goes and checks the database for the password and matches it so even here there can be unanticipated issues like there could be a connection issue or uh, maybe i changed my password recently and 
it didn't get updated in the backend yet. So these kinds of issues can still happen. But uh, apart from that, it's almost uh, deterministic. Like if I enter 9999, there's no way the computer can make a mistake in saying this is the same password. But uh, some of the uh, technologies that we that computers use for matching things are not deterministic. They are probabilistic, wherein uh, the answer of whether this is true or false, whether this is right password or wrong password, whether this person's identity is correct or not, is not a sure yes and sure no. <clears throat> it will be more like I'm 0.95 percent, <clears throat> I mean 0.95 or 95 percent sure that <clears throat> this is the unsigned. Sorry, I was just coughing. The this is 95 percent sure this identity matches, or this person is the person they're claiming, or 80 percent sure, or 50 percent sure, or zero percent sure, something like that. And uh, and then the the human operators of this program set a threshold which says only if you are 99 percent sure do you consider them as a real match, and otherwise you don't. So. Uh, any idea of where these probabilistic systems are running uh, in our uh, world right now? I'm assuming the fingerprint scanner because I, I, I sometimes see that there is a definition when in, in the devices where I work at, and that and uh, another person's name gets triggered or recognized for that fingerprint. Oh. Wow, <laughs> makes sense. Uh, Arun, you were also going to say something. I was uh, saying the same thing, like face lock is the face lock. Yeah. Hmm, hmm. Okay, so basically, uh, the the kind of things which are um, uh, which are you know not exactly captured or which could be slightly different uh, every time uh, uh, every time it is captured so every time you take a photo of yourself there would be some slight difference the lighting would be different or uh, the angle would be slightly different or something like that and therefore you can't have the computer say that only if each pixel of this image matches each pixel of the other other image can it be considered as the same person if that's the case you would lock your phone once and you would never be able to unlock it or your fingerprint would never work because every time you keep your finger you would keep it in a slightly different way and the way the reader works also i mean these are uh, fingerprint is just a bump on your finger skin right like uh, and your finger is like something that's uh, fleshy, so you press it, the shape changes. So you can never have the same uh, fingerprint uh, once more. You, <laughs> the, the moment you lift your hand, and uh, or even the mo moment you press it, uh, at the beginning of the press and uh, when you press it harder, all of that is different. So your computer can never have a very deterministic way of saying this is the same thing fingerprint as this, this other one or face match or all of those so in those circumstances or voice match for example uh, you would have to use uh, some kind of a threshold with which computer will say i'm this person confident and the human will uh, human operator will say okay above this threshold you do it uh, automatically uh, it is if it is between say 70% and 90% let a human also review if it's less than 70% reject it straight away. So these kinds of uh, uh, rules can be set by the operator. For example, in that uh, bounced check, it could be that uh, uh, because the computer detected too much uh, uh, text, it, it, it automatically rejected it uh, straight away. But uh, if there was a slight mismatch, uh, like the surname was not written, uh, and the computer was like not uh, not very sure. Maybe it could have flagged for a human review, right? Like we can configure the system in any way we want. 
So this this particular aspect of computers not being able to determine certain things uh, deterministically, uh, but only probabilistically, is where uh, automated uh, reviews, even uh, even in case of uh, automated content takedowns. So for example, uh, let's come back to the wire issue. What happened uh, originally? Uh, let me try to share the screen. Uh, So uh, this is the original wire post. Uh, what's happening here is uh, they got a screenshot of a uh, or a document uh, from a particular uh, source who they say are working within uh, Meta or Instagram or Meta's Meta is the parent company of Instagram. So. Uh, or some somehow related to Instagram, they haven't revealed exactly what the relationship is. Who said that uh, there was a particular story uh, or a post? I'm not sure which which one. I think it's a story as per this document, which was removed from uh, a, a particular Instagram account on the account that it had sexual. Uh, photo or uh, sexual activity and nudity and uh, the, the document that uh, wire kind of got from the source actually said that uh, it goes into f some further details but let's let's uh, let's start with the, the 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 this particular point so this is the actual document i'm not sure if it is very clearly visible so uh, this is someone doing some kind of a puja on another figure. Can, can you see that uh, uh, photo? Kind of click just to make uh, enough sense of it. Get a better photo of this. You know how to search uh, reverse searching? Am I outside? I'm not uh, audible anymore. Have I gotten disconnected? I'm speaking to myself. There it is. Yeah, so this is a photo. Hello. Hi, people. Hello, you are audible. Ah, okay, okay. So you're there. Uh, so this is uh, Yogi Adityanath, the CM of UP, and someone is doing, uh, uh, I suppose, some puja. This was the photo, and uh, it was taken down by uh, Instagram. Now, uh, how how do you think this can happen? Why, why would this be taken down on the account that uh, so Instagram sent a notification to the account uh, holder that it is uh, having sexual activity or nudity. Of course, if you have read the news article, it is kind of uh, boring to answer this, but then just consider all the possibilities, like what are the different ways this can get taken down. Because of the, uh, that cloth color, it resembles the skin color, I think that might be the reason. Makes sense, makes sense. So you're saying because this uh, cloth kind of looks skin colored, if uh, say there was an automated uh, system that checked for nudity, it might have probabilistically uh, said, okay, maybe there's a possibility that there is some nudity in this picture and that uh, it has to be removed, correct? That's what you're saying. Any other possibilities?
Okay, I will get a T and comma. I have Bluetooth heads on, so I can hear you. <laughs> Hi, you I lost here. connection. I think for a minute. Ah, uh, okay. So uh, I was showing the image that was removed. Uh, uh, the the story that was removed contained this image, and it was removed on the account that it had sexual activity or nudity, and. Uh, Arun suggested it could be because the color of this uh, uh, statue or the person's cloth looks like a skin color, and therefore an algorithm could have determined probabilistically that it may be having uh, sexual activity or nudity, and maybe that's why it got removed. So I was saying, um, what other possibilities can there be? Fine, let me uh, actually move forward uh, because we have to also cover DKIM. So the uh, the other possibility I was hoping that uh, someone would come up with was maybe the automated system didn't uh, immediately detect it as nudity, but maybe if a random person reported it once and then uh, the automated system would run on it uh, and give it a lower threshold for detecting it as nudity. Maybe, I mean, let's say uh, the system kind of figured out, okay, there's 50% chance that there's nudity in it. And then um, because it's just 50%, it allowed the post automatically. But then the moment someone reports it, uh, then it goes back and sees, okay, there is 50% chance there is uh, nudity and there's also a human being who has reported it as nudity. So maybe, uh, maybe this can be removed. So that could be another possibility. And uh, the possibility that uh, Wire brings out is that uh, uh, apparently the document that uh, uh, was shared by the source contained this particular uh, section of uh, information which said reported by user PK uh, user ID and then it said is verified true and has check true. And then it says skipped auto moderation. The reason is reporting user as exec privileges and therefore uh, review not required and review denied and report accepted. And it also says notify user at Amit Malvia. So the, the, the uh, as per this transcript of uh, text, it sounds like uh, this user who reported it is at Amit Marvia because that's the person who was uh, notified at the end. This this person who was also notified is the original author of the post. And uh, there seems to be the uh, uh, reason that it was automatically denied and review not review denied and all of that seems to be that user has extra privileges. This is the uh, fundamental uh, argument that uh, Wire is making. They also make it uh, more uh, controversial or like uh, they have added some more uh, bits to it, uh, which kind of makes it sound like it was done very intentionally or uh, things like that, that uh, BJP has access to uh, do, do things like this, that they can remove any post at any time. Uh, all of these claims have been added. Now, what happened immediately afterwards is uh, as usual, people started uh, denying that this is true that uh, they said so there is one important detail uh, this uh, particular uh, document was apparently coming from an internal um, uh, workplace.com uh, instance so workplace is a facebook service for people to um, kind of communicate in a workplace and uh, the the screenshot or the the document apparently came from instagram.workplace.com this is the domain name that uh, was showing up on the uh, report and the uh, document so uh, immediately the meta team or people from meta denied it saying that they do not use this domain name 
So again, this is a uh, matter of identity. So how do we know this is Instagram's domain or if this is something owned by Meta? Just because the name says Instagram this, doesn't mean- actually, actually, I have a doubt. So this, hmm. uh, so this workplace, workplace ID was with the person who is probably the, who is probably the, what do you call, whistleblower who works inside the Instagram, who gave out this information to the wire, right? He had this idea. That's the, that's the belief that wire is uh, firm with. As in wire believes strongly that the source that okay. communicated to them is a whistleblower who works in Instagram. Uh, or, and who uh, has this ID? Who has this like domain name? Huh. Now this uh, again, uh, Instagram workplace.com, uh, I'll open workplace.com. It's a, um, it's a service by <laughs> none other than Meta, uh, wherein you, it's like Google Drive or Google Docs and Google Chat and all of that together. It's like a Facebook just for your workplace. And um, in workplace, uh, every organization can set up their own subdomain. So here it is instagram.workplace.com, which means someone, some organization or some individual has set up in workplace.com a subdomain called Instagram, which uh, is where this particular thing was posted. Make sense? So yeah, the, the, the last one, actually, I just lost it. Yeah. Network. Yeah. I, I have to repeat. Huh? Oh, so uh, workplace.com is a service by Meta, wherein company employees can talk to each other and communicate. It, it basically becomes a Facebook for a particular company. And uh, the way it works is if I had to set up a workplace for uh, this group, for example, it would be called purposefulprogramming.workplace.com or something like that. And uh, someone has uh, set up a workplace uh, organization called instagram.workplace.com. And this particular document, uh, which was shared by uh, Wire, was apparently posted in this uh, instagram.workplace.com uh, domain as a note like a post and in the later stories they say that uh, this is a domain uh, which is used uh, internally for uh, and not all employees have access to it and it helps to record incidences where they have to share data with local governments or uh, law and order agencies wherein these governments cannot have access on the main system of uh, Instagram or Facebook or whatever and this allows them to access it through a side channel or uh, through a different domain is the later explanation that Wire through the source has provided about um, this particular workplace.com instance. So that might uh, give some context, but the immediate rejection that Meta had was that they do not use this instagram.workplace.com domain. It is not theirs. So, they, uh, they have, Meta. yeah. Yeah, so um, when they take down that, took down that post, they didn't have an official reason. I mean, the reason of taking down that post is what is coming from this report, right? From this so called insight. As per the author, uh, the person, the account who actually posted it, cringe ar archivist, they also got the notification that uh, it was deleted due to nudity or sexual activity. As per them, from their side, they would get a notification, right? So, and then this, this thing came separately, which said, uh, this entire history of who reported and why was it, uh, why was the review denied? So after they got the notification, they, uh, applied for a review saying this is falsely removed, but their review was also denied the, the uh, original accounts. 
So this one apparently gives a reason why it was denied. So Meta never uh, officially said that it was uh, it was uh, removed due to this reason, right? Uh, Meta. Yes, right. uh, so Meta's, Meta's uh, defense uh, after this story was published and all of that, they said that, yeah, it is true that there is no nudity or sexual activity, but it was our automated systems, like we earlier saw, uh, probabilistic matching. They said it was the automated systems which removed the picture and that no human being reviewed it or no human was involved in the loop and it was not like an Amit Malviya or anyone reported it and therefore it was removed. Okay. Okay. So, uh, publicly Meta kind of uh, said uh, they have, uh, they don't use this uh, Meta uh, Instagram.workplace.com domain. Um, so, this is another, uh, I was just going to point out earlier. That this is an instance of identity just because something is written as instagram.workplace.com and has an instagram icon here doesn't mean that it is the actual instagram that is running this domain right so we have no way of verifying who is running this domain or who is uh, um, using this particular account but has yeah. the meta denied it like has instagram denied it that it is not their account yeah. yeah they have they have said that they do not use this domain it's not theirs so it is not really uh, i mean that verifiable because maybe the wire will be very confident because they know someone and they don't want to reveal who the so called whistleblower is but yeah for us i won't i don't see a way to verify who uh -huh. Now here is a question, how can wire be sure that the whistleblower is or the so called whistleblower is not playing wire like is not fake uh, supplying fake evidence uh, to mislead wire into thinking that it is an actual domain. That is the argument that Meta and many others raised against the wires report saying the wire what they think they are genuinely doing something but they have been fooled some random person has sent them this uh, link and the photo and screenshot and video or whatever but this is not an actual domain it's all made up by themselves and for example uh, i'll just complete the point imagine i went and signed up at workplace.com it's a free service i believe i'm not sure uh, at least there's a small uh, small plan uh, uh, for five dollars or something core plan for four dollars now imagine i signed up with four dollars and gave the name as uh, instagram india and gave the logo as instagram india or something and then i create a document like this uh, i create a document like this i upload it to the portal and then i take a screenshot and uh, video and all of that and share it with wire how do they know that this is not what happened So, uh, uh, in actuality of the case, we have more data because of because of wire publishing more articles. So, I think they said uh, that there were internal emails about how it got leaked to the wire, and the then the then the defense of Meta was that we don't use at the rate fb dot com or something, right? But then the no, uh, oh, oh, let the me web, stop you there. Let me stop you there. What if those emails never came? Like you, that is all happening after this. At this point in time, how how can Wire be sure that uh, this is a true domain? That okay, this whistleblower is an actual. Thing. Yeah, so I don't think there is a way to know that. I mean, if the whistleblower is so called extremely quote unquote trusted, then only <laughs> they can ensure that but for us outsiders even then there would be no way to know right so the wire is true, true. From it, then, then us at, at this point because they are in contact with that whistleblower and they can't they don't want to tell who is that right so 
Correct. Yeah. What people so, outside are claiming is also that even wire doesn't have a way to prove or to believe any person like that. Because imagine this happens. Imagine this is a theory I came up with. Okay. Imagine Meta wanted to destroy wires credibility. Imagine Meta hired someone to, I mean, of course, this is a ridiculous uh, hypothesis, but nevertheless, uh, or if not Meta, someone else uh, like uh, um, BJP or anyone, uh, some random person hired a person and made them believe that you are now um, a staff of Instagram and then you have to use these things and all of that. And uh, perhaps uh, this person was a conscientious person and they leaked this info to wire or like what if the source is source itself is wrong or what if wires um, wires uh, credential verification of the source was wrong. What if wire thought the source is uh, true but uh, they were giving them fake identity cards they were giving them fake emails how, how can wire verify was the first doubt that people raised and wire kept saying that we have multiple sources and they uh, i don't know if they have said multiple sources i think they have at least one more source who confirmed that this domain exists or so something like that they said uh, and that some of these sources they had approached uh, themselves and the source didn't come to them so uh, it is less likely that uh, they were uh, someone was trying to cheat them or fool them so these were the kind of arguments that why i was making uh, and then uh, after uh, a day or so uh, the emails that you were referring to Ravi, those came up wherein uh, wire got a screenshot of uh, an email which said uh, i mean this is a screenshot open in front of me uh, it's apparently from someone called andy stone and there is an andy stone in facebook uh, uh, meta uh, who does these kinds of uh, uh, responses and it says at fb.com and it says to team and this thing and then uh, what you all have read of how did this get leaked and all of that so if this email is true then it kind of makes uh, 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 some sense or some credibility to the idea that this document is real because it's saying got leaked i mean even then it's based on language and stuff like that but nevertheless so here is where uh, the second identity question comes up how do we know this email is real we can again trust the source that is uh, another way but we are already doubting whether the source is real or not right like now what what can the source do to prove that this is a real email is there anything that the source can do what do you mean by that, real email like an existing like from the andy stone themselves correct correct how, how do they know that this was uh, from andy yeah, stone was, okay so there we come to the dkim thing <laughs> exactly so uh, before we use the word dkim how, how can uh, just think about it like how does email infrastructure work and what, what uh, factor of authentication is uh, relevant here, which makes it uh, uh, possible to verify that this is actually Andy Stone? Who owns the domain or something like that? Okay, smart. So at fb.com is a domain that is owned by Facebook. Can anyone make an account there? Like that is also a question. So only, only the people staff of we can. Right. So, uh, yeah. So Ma I think Meta's defense is also relevant here. They said they don't use this domain for any communication, or they use Meta. Dot at the rate Meta. Dot com as well. Correct. I mean, that is a, a, a distraction because uh, people have seen that uh, people have been emailing from at fb.com because in the past there used to be fb.com and uh, fb changed their name to meta, but the domains still continue to work and people, others have gotten emails from fb.com and including Andy Stone at fb.com uh, in the past uh, one month, August, September, October, etc.
not October, uh, August and September. So the, the specific question is, uh, how, how would, okay, let me use DKM itself. How do you think DKM works? What is your hypothesis on how it works? So DKM is domain key. Basically, it is so. it is domain domain level authentication. Like, so the sender of the, the receiver of the email gets a so called digital signature from the domain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, see every domain name on internet. How it works? Every domain name is mapped to a IP address, it's called DNS. Like, for example, uh, every person, every phone SIM has a phone SIM card as a phone number, right? So, when you call someone, uh, you, you need to know their phone number. So, when we when we browse or when we go to a website, we know, need to know, know the website's IP address. So, every server has, like, every uh, domain has a IP address. So, for example, google.com will or the dawire.com the dawire.in they all have a ip address so this ip address is in a record book you know is in a dns uh, there's a there's a mapping contact list type of thing for example you know a phone number directory analogous to that there is a public dns directory matching every domain name to its ip address so there, 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 there is a public key of the sender uh, of that domain uh, domain name, and from that key, we can match other digital signature of mm -hmm. the person. So basically, in short, DKIM is a way to ensure that the email came from the same domain that the uh, that the uh, sender is claiming correct correct so uh, uh i'll just add to that i don't know what whether my gmail is let me open it in a different tab first and see if there's any sensitive emails uh so uh let's say uh yeah i'm gonna open this back into can you see a gmail window open on my computer hello yeah we can see yeah so so email uh, although we see it in a neat and uh, uh, beautiful format if we go to the origin oh sorry i'm trying to reply if we go to the original uh, email there is a way to see the original show original uh, it usually has these headers. So uh, there are lots of uh, metadata or headers above the email and then email starts uh, somewhere in the middle. So this uh, particular uh, headers include a lot of information. It, it, it talks about which server sent it to me, which server came to uh, was originally uh, received the email, which email did it come from, which which computers did it go through. A lot of those information is there. And uh, like Ravi was saying, uh, one of these uh, fields uh, is something called a DKIM signature, which means uh, if, uh, uh, how do I explain this? So uh, yeah, like, like again, like Ravi said, uh, if we go to the website this came from, which is programmingdigest.net, and uh, if we search uh, for the selector, so this S1 selector, so DKM search, I'm gonna, <clears throat> so 
so this is a random uh, website where we can search for the selector uh, the the signature that uh, Ravi was talking about so we can see th that they have published uh, programdigest.net has published a signature called uh, s1 uh, called s1 which is this long complicated list of string so this uh, this is not like human signatures where you just see okay this signature is also there in this email and therefore they are the same uh, they are coming they are original that's not how it works it's a bit more involved and involves a public key, public key cryptography and uh, asymmetric encryption and things like that wherein um, this particular uh, signature can be matched to the signature here uh, i don't know which field is the signature probably this this is the signature i think uh, this signature these signatures can be matched to the content of the uh, email so this the one in my email uh, the signature in my email is arrived at using a combination of this particular uh, signatures uh, original secret that only programming digest.net has and the content of these emails so the from field subject field mime version field content type field content transfer encoding field and id field two field cc field these many fields from this email so all of these uh, from date message id subject and the body of this they they use this much data a secret that only programming digest.net has and the content of this email to arrive at this signature and uh, with some mathematics and some um, cryptographic uh, operations we can verify as a uh, if we write a software which can do the verification or there are lots of software which does that the, we can verify that this signature matches the uh, signature here and therefore this email the these fields that have been described here are all correct and they have not been tampered with i mean uh, it's a bit uh, uh, i did not have enough time to explain it but uh, you can see my gmail uh, client has also told uh, done that verification and has it has said that dkim it passes with the domain programming digest.net which means uh, as it is written here dkim, DKIM. this dkim signature it has passed which means i can trust this uh, email to have come from this address to have uh, this subject to have uh, this content transfer encoding this list and subscribe this x feedback and this two two address this cc address if i trust programming digest.net so as far as programming digest.net is concerned this is all uh, correctly uh, valid and this email is coming from jacob at programming digestion.net and if i touch programming digestion.net i can be verified that i can be uh, clear that it is jacob who sent it so that's the rough uh, overview of how dkm works uh, we have actually run out of time by a lot of minutes um, what do we do now that uh, are there any uh, burning questions about DKIM or can we kind of um, end this or should we extend this? What do, what do you all say? So, one okay. question that I had was um, uh, like, I mean, how are we making sense of today's session in the broad scheme of things? Okay, fine. So, uh, 
maybe i'll just uh, try to wrap up with an answer to that or a response to that so um, computers can do and uh, this is a recent blog post of mine i'll share it in the group it can do two things very well it can do a lot of calculations and it can do communications so basically it processes information and it can communicate information and it's called information and communications technology in some some senses also so uh, a lot of what we do with computers will all fall in the same pattern either there is information being processed in some ways or manipulated in some ways calculations computations all of that or there is some communication and uh, when it comes to communications uh, a lot of the communications that we do have the same kind of e repeated issues the issue of how do we ascertain the identity how do we uh, make sure that this receives the person the other person without it being tampered in between uh, how do we just make sense of uh, like uh, Ravi was saying this idea of addresses dns how do we know which computer to talk to to be able to search on google or to be able to uh, access uh, so uh, i think even today vaishnavi can't access meet.nixnet.services on the computer uh, and they have to use a mobile phone so what are these issues in networking in communication between computers so all of these are kind of uh, connected to each other and there is the 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 entire domain of communications technology uh, wherever programming is used this kind of uh, issues keep coming up and uh, to understand how these work is really critical to be able to actually do anything related to communications using computers and therefore uh, this is a case study on some of the crucial um, aspects of uh, communications which when we like try to understand in detail we will learn a lot about uh, how the internet works how computers communicate with each other how we can have a secure uh, mode of communication where someone else can't eavesdrop as to what we are discussing with someone else um, and this identity verification of that so i'm hoping that this particular case study will trigger an interest in those kinds of in-depth uh, uh, learning or exploration in that particular field of uh, communications. Yeah, thanks, Akshay. I think that, uh, like, I, I sort of had a sense for, the, I mean, I, I mean, I think I, as this session progressed, I ended up thinking that, okay, um, uh, it would probably have something to do with this. So, yeah, thanks for that. It's wonderful. Okay, so uh, uh, I'll just call it uh, 10 minutes too long, but end. Uh, feel free to stay back if you would like to. Uh, but yeah, feel free to leave at this point. If you have any comments or thoughts or questions, happy. Yeah, I think an important important question would be that um, we, I think uh, the, there's no doubt in uh, Meta or Facebook having so much power over the communications in whatever sense you want to say. Like, for example, they, they are probably used by almost like they have WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook all in their control, right? So they control a large pop large fraction of population. I don't know the statistic, exact statistic, but I have a feeling that they do have, like a lot of people use digital uh, devices to contact each other using these tools. And plus this, uh, this case of removing posts or uh, like, so, uh, uh, take, taking down th uh, things so what can we do about it I think uh, is a good question and 
like i think we should think about that i am not saying that uh, <laughs> we discuss it right now but i mean that's that's mm -hmm. a, that question i think that we should think what can we do about it because we know that probably we, there's no doubt in them doing all these things generally Ravi, right? do you want to do you want to talk about how decentralized technologies like the ones you work on kind of address that or maybe not address that uh... okay so decentralized technologies so for example what okay so the thing is one example of de decentralized uh, communication is email and another is phone so what kind of freedom it, it gives to the user is that if you compare this with whatsapp for example i have a whatsapp account i have all my family members there right it is a kind of centralized in the sense that it is controlled by one entity which is whatsapp or facebook whatever and i if i have to talk to anyone they also must have a whatsapp account in email this is not the case so you have a account on gmail.com but you can still talk to a person on yahoo.com so but the thing is it's not centralized gmail.com is another entity yahoo.com is another entity you can still talk so if you switch from yahoo.com to another um, another email provider tomorrow you can still talk to your friends right using email but the same is not the case with whatsapp so if you switch from whatsapp to telegram you kind of have to bring everyone to telegram to talk with them so this is one of the problems with centralized entities that you know we it's kind of a lock in everyone is forced to use the same service to communicate do you have any specific thoughts about the content moderation and content take down bit that you were talking about with respect to decentralized technologies how does it work uh, is it a solution that you were looking for no i haven't thought about it <laughs> hmm 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 so yeah. i think the question I mean, would be what hmm. who, it's very hard in the sense that who decides what what should stay and i mean that's very i think that's where we should start who decides what what would stay and who decides what should be posted and what is acceptable and all and so here the clear problem is that facebook is deciding what will stay and what will not and it has already been proven to be harmful there's that in the cambridge analytica scandal so once it happened that uh, there was a company called cambridge analytica right so they they took data from facebook analyzed for millions of users and probably swing swing like manipulated their opinions to swing elections or like uh, influence elections in the us right so what i'm saying is that in uh, this all kinds of also manipulates public opinions and harms freedom of speech but the thing is the question asked was what i think about the content moderation so first of all i i think who decides what will stay and all is very complicated but for me uh, the solution that i have come to and it's kind of a question i think it's an evasion of the real question maybe but i have grown comfortable to this idea so there, there is this platform called mastodon or like it's called fed fediverse there is like people from <clears throat> many services like they can register on different services independent services and they can still talk to each other see each other's posts you know for example if you were on maybe on twitter and you can still see instagram posts similar to that something like that so in that case what happens is if I, if i am on a server like maybe if i am on um, uh, if i am on a service uh, my takedown is like like there are independent services so service policies can differ and there can be for example one server for 
science background for example right so there will be posts related to science but not for other fields there can be one for like for some specific church or temple so then they will post about those things not about others so they can have their own policies on what is what is acceptable and what is not on their own service and uh, yeah this is a kind of this is the idea i've grown used to i don't think hmm. i don't know what is the so solution if, the if solution. i if i if i were to characterize it uh, the way i would characterize it is it's a more decentralized form of content moderation also uh, wherein it's not one meta's content moderation guidelines that applies to everyone but it's a, a different instance uh, has different content moderation guidelines and different content moderators and there is some amount of choice between uh, this and that and this and that and this and that so some amount of decentralization in moderation also has been achieved uh, with uh, some decentralized technologies like mastodon or activity pub protocol based uh, fediverse yes yes so it also gives control mm. control to people in many mm. sense but i would agree i would agree that it's a, it's a harder problem than that and that uh, it would need uh, it it is not a technological problem as such it's more about what should human beings uh, it's it's a question on free speech and uh, reasonable limits on free speech and how much human beings are susceptible to narratives and meta narratives and i don't know uh, propaganda and all of that uh, and i mean it's it sounds really complicated to even think about some of these questions yes uh, i agree with you i think it all comes up, like in my opinion every every discussion of this sort in my own brain ends up like whatever may a lot of people think is acceptable and they choose to accept probably world world becomes like that so it's like meta enforcing things on people to do things in a certain way but then yes people also accept it there might be many other companies who have tried probably to do that but they might not have been successful so when a lot of people accept a certain way of doing things or a certain philosophy things like that so that also has impact on the world okay so any anyone else has any comments or uh, thoughts so uh... if not we can kind of end the call hmm Okay, I'm going to end the call. Uh, mm.